This is an interview with William F. Sheehan, New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is 6th of June, 2003, um, approximately 1.30 p.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Surely, Mike. William F. Sheehan, born in Stillwater, New York, on December 11, 1921. Okay. What was your educational background prior to entering military service? I was a graduate of Stillwater High School, class of 1939. After setting pins in a local bowling alley called Stillwater Recreation Center for about six months, I went to Albany Business College and received a one-year executive secretarial diploma. That was my entire education prior to World War II. Okay. Um, where were you and what do you call, recall of your reaction to the news about Pearl Harbor? I was in the Stillwater Recreation Center bowling. At that time I was night clerk at the Albany office of the FBI in Albany. I was bowling on a Sunday afternoon the day of Pearl Harbor when the office called my home and I was summoned to work to get down to Albany as soon as possible. I think I arrived down at the uh, Albany office at approximately 7 o'clock. And I recall, I believe I worked until about 1 o'clock the next afternoon. It was a busy night and busy early morning, believe me. Do you know what your re initial reaction was when you heard about this attack? Yes, I was both shocked and saddened. I didn't know what it would mean, except I thought, gee, maybe we'll be invaded uh, by the Japanese. Uh, it's just a terrible reaction in my mind at that time. What, what was the uh, FBI's reaction to that? I mean, were they uh, really tightening security around the city and the state? Do you recall what was going on? I don't recall the initial reaction that particular day, other than everyone was excited and troubled and uh, all the personnel uh, were summoned to work. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a vague recollection that shortly after that time uh, there was an immense concern and drive uh, concerning enemy, so-called enemy aliens. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was my first association or knowledge of anything of that nature. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um Maybe, I guess, could you tell us some of your duties then between that time and when you went into military service in the FBI? Surely. Um, As a night clerk, uh, the responsibility was really enormous, and uh, I marvel to this day how at that uh, young age of about 19 to 21 or so, I was able to handle the diverse tasks that were assigned to me. I was a file clerk, I was a typist, I ran uh, copies on the so-called mimeograph machine, I sent out teletype messages to the 56 offices that were located throughout the country, I received telegraphic messages, I handled the switchboard duties, so uh, I had a nice variety of experiences for a young fellow, but I enjoyed the camaraderie of the uh, staff and the personnel. The agents used me uh, wonderful, and uh, I had a very nice relationship with the uh, special agent in charge and the number one man, his assistant. Mm -hmm. um, were you drafted or did you enlist? I had two deferments, six months each, as I was classified as a confidential files and indexed analyst. The uh, person on night duty had to make decisions when telephone calls came in, whether there was some sort of real scare or someone was making a call just as a prank or whatever. Uh, 
By the summer, however, of 1943, I just had the feeling that most of my friends were in the service and they'd been in for six months or a year. And I thought, well, although I may be important to the FBI here, I felt I should make a contribution to the uh, military. So uh, I was drafted in September of 1943. Mm -hmm. uh, where was your induction center? I was named acting corporal out of Mechanicville. And the induction center was located, uh, well, we originally were sworn in in Albany mm -hmm. on September the 11th. There were 10 from Mechanicville and two of us from Stillwater. Those that went in the Navy were given a week's leave. I believe three out of the 12 went into the Navy. The other nine of us were given three weeks furlough. And the actual induction center for us was Camp Upton down near Patchogue on Long Island. Okay. Where did you go for your basic training? The basic training was given at partially at Camp Upton. I was assigned to a unit that uh, received so-called commando training for two to three weeks. And it was a terrific uh, training. I think I lost something like 12 to 15 pounds. And I thought for sure I was headed for the Rangers, the infantry, or whatever. And shortly after completing that training, to my amazement, I was sent back to Camp Upton to sell insurance to the inductees. And then I was later transferred to Port Ontario, where I completed my basic training. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you receive any other special training outside of the Ranger training? No, I did not. Okay. Um, when were you sent overseas? Well, there was quite a story behind that. I was uh, classified as a 405, a typist clerk. I was uh, blessed with uh, great accurate hands for typing. At that time, I could probably type 75 words a minute over a sustained period without making any errors. So I was in about 10 camps in the country. I was in California in December of 1944, waiting assignment to the Pacific. The so-called Battle of the Bulge happened. It started, I believe, around December 15. Within two weeks, some sort of an executive order was issued. And if a soldier didn't have flat feet, if he didn't wear glasses, or didn't have dentures, for the most part, most of those men like myself were transferred to the infantry. So I went from California down to Camp Livingston in Louisiana, just outside of Alexandria, for either two or three weeks of infantry training, and finally went overseas. Uh, late in February or early in March of 1945. Mm -hmm. okay. um, now I noticed you went over into a replacement center. Yes, I did, Mike. Uh, there's an interesting story there. When I arrived in La Havre. All the ammunition I had in my ammo belt was taken from me. And that seemed to suggest that during the Battle of the Bulge, our troops must have used up just about all their supply of ammunition and whatever. And about three days later, I was standing on the Rhine River in Bonn without any ammunition whatsoever and carrying an M1 rifle. Amazing. Um, could you tell us about your duties after that, where you were assigned and, and what some of your duties were? Surely. Uh, shortly after standing at, uh, on the Rhine River in Bonn, I was transferred to what was called a REPL DEP, a replacement depot. I believe there was approximately 200 of us in that REPL DEP. And the purpose of sending us there was to have us available as infantry replacements to take the place of those who were either wounded or, or killed on the front lines. I think it was in this REPL DEP 
about two days and fortunately a provost marshal, a lieutenant colonel, I believe his name was John Bradley, drove up in a jeep and he was seeking two men out of 200 who could type. There were three of us and he decided he'd take the three of us and moved us back about 10 miles from where this rebel death was. And from that period on, while I was overseas, I served in the headquarters company of the 7th Corps. Could I stop you there for Surely. a second? Okay, okay so you go ahead were continue. served with the headquarters company of the 7th Corps? Yes. Okay, could you tell us about what you did there? And Surely. Uh, the 7th Corps Headquarters Company primarily consisted of military police. And during the day, they would go out in their vehicles and check on the activities of other soldiers, to see if they were driving in an overcrowded vehicle, see whether or not they were wearing their helmets. Uh, and they would write them up for any military infractions. And they would bring those tickets or paperwork, what have you, uh, back to the office and the two other men in the office, a fellow by the name of uh, Bob Cronin, who later became mayor of Glens Falls, and a fellow by the name of John Patton, no relation to the General Patton, and myself would type up papers in accordance with the violations. Okay. Um, I see you ran into a famous baseball player over there. Yes, I did. Tell us about, about that. Okay. Uh, it was really uh, prior to going overseas. Oh, okay. Uh, after I was uh, assigned to uh, Port Ontario, uh, later I was reassigned to Pine Camp. And I was in a unit of the Second Service Command that primarily consisted of teachers and attorneys and those who had proficient typing and accounting skills. And what would happen was this. When men were inducted into the Army in Camp Upton or Fort Dix, and they scored between 65 and 75 on their original induction test, they would be sent to our Second Service Command unit. And these former teachers would give them training for two weeks to a month and they would be retested with the hope and expectation that their scores would improve. And if and when they improved, they were shipped elsewhere to start their army service. While I was at Pine Camp, Albert Red Sheendeast appeared one Saturday morning and the major in charge of our unit recognized his name. It seems as if in the previous year Red Sheendeast had played with Rochester in the International League and had been a sensational player. So Red was with us for just a few weeks and then transferred on. Only recently I've discovered that Red shortly after leaving Pine Camp was discharged from the service in Florida. And I always wondered why he was discharged so suddenly. A book was just written last year by a Boston author, and he talked to Red about his life. And it seems when Red was a real young fellow, he was playing, and some clip entered one of his eyes. And the doctor told the mother that he might lose the sight of the eye he would probably require surgery of some kind, but he couldn't guarantee the positive results. So the family decided to leave that clip in the eye. So when Red reached the major leagues, he became a switch hitter. And the reason he wanted to be a switch hitter, he always stood, instead of having the usual batting stance with the two feet in the batter's box, he would turn so his good eye would be facing the pitcher, whether he was batting right-handed or left. He was very successful. Played with the Cardinals something like 14 to 16 years and wound up as coach and then later manager. 
And uh, when he entered the Hall of Fame, I believe his average was something like 284, which is uh, fantastic. He's just a wonderful person. Okay. Um, all right, when you were uh, over in Germany, then that's predominantly where you served then. Uh, were you aware of, uh, with this MP unit, were, did they have anything involved with any of the concentration camps or anything like that? Do you recall anything? My only recollection of that, Mike, uh, I believe we were in the vicinity of Nordhausen at one time. And I believe Nordhausen housed one of the so-called Big Six uh, camps, concentration camps. I believe some of our soldiers went and visited that camp. I did not. Okay. Um, so you stayed over there until after the war was over in the Army of Occupation? Or? No, I'm glad you asked me that. Shortly after the war ended in Europe, BE Day, mm -hmm. many of us were transferred to a camp and the camps at that time for the returning veterans were named after cigarettes. Right. And the particular camp I was in was called 20 Grand. And I was in this camp 20 Grand somewhere between 10 days and two weeks. And I had a, a pleasurable experience or two while there. While walking around the campgrounds one morning, I met a fellow by the name of Bill Smith from my hometown. Uh, back in 1936, Bill had been about the number two tennis player on a tennis team. I was uh, probably ranked number five or six on that same team. So it was a very pleasurable meeting. A few days later, while still at 20 grand, I met another chap from my hometown of Stillwater by the name of Herb Lee. And again, it was a very enjoyable and pleasant experience. Well, the reason for the delay in keeping us at uh, these cigarette camps is the Army decided that they would send back first the wounded men and secondly those that had the longest period of service. I had only been overseas slightly over four months. So when I came back to the States, I knew that my stay was going to be temporary. I was given a 30-day furlough and we were told that we were being assigned to the Pacific. The Seventh Corps would go to California and later probably participate in the invasion of Japan. There's a interesting episode about this too that I'll share with you the scuttlebutt I heard. When many of the more experienced and college educated members of the Seventh Corps came back home for 30 days. They discovered that there was a corps in California called the 36 Corps who had never been overseas. So as a consequence, many of the more senior members of the 7th Corps that had the education and the knowledge that was not mine at that time thought, gee, this is, this is un unfair. The Seventh Corps participated in the Italian campaign, the invasion of, uh, of uh, Europe, and now they were expected to go over and invade Japan, and there's a corps in the States with not any overseas service whatsoever. So I did not participate in this program that was carried on, but many members of the Seventh Corps sent telegrams and letters to people such as Walter Winchell, who had a Sunday evening radio broadcast at that time, to their various senators, members of Congress. And suddenly, as a result of that kind of pressure, the Seventh Corps, on paper, became the 36th Corps. And the 36th Corps became the Seventh Corps. So the seventh, our original Seventh Corps uh, never was headed to Japan after uh -huh. that. Uh -huh. um, what do you recall, where were you and uh, what was your reaction to the death of President Roosevelt? 
I was in the Repeldep camp when President Roosevelt died. I believe there was two things that happened within a week or ten days while I was in that camp. One related to the death of President Roosevelt and the other related to the death of Ernie Pyle. Ernie Pyle meant so much to so many as Roosevelt meant to the people back here. But to the men in the service, particularly those in the infantry, and I suspect Marines, Ernie Pyle was just a, an outstanding individual and a hero. And the soldiers were sad to lose these two giants within a matter of 10 days. Uh, what was your reaction when you heard about the dropping of the atomic bombs? I didn't have any uh, decision-making power or anything of that kind. But from what I felt and what I knew then, I have the same feeling now. I think I was, if I was in President Truman's shoes, I would have ordered the dropping of it as devastating and terrible for the civilian losses that those two bombs caused. I think the Japanese were so fanatic that I believe some of the estimates that were made at the time prior to their dropping uh, were realistic. When I read today and over the years since my discharge about what went on in the Pacific and Iwo Jima and Okinawa and the devastating losses our Marines suffered. Uh, I, I, I just feel that the Japanese would have held out and American casualties would be huge. And I feel it's very unfortunate that uh, certainly after the first bomb was dropped that there wasn't some surrender taking uh, so it, we wouldn't have had to drop the second. Uh, when were you discharged and where? I was discharged at Camp Callum, California, which is a little camp just a few miles from San Diego. And I might share with you uh, a little story on that one. Just prior to going to Camp Callum, I had been in another camp in California. The name escapes me at the moment. But when I was at this camp in California, one night at the PX, I met a classmate of mine, Bill Hanahan, from Stillwater, New York. And Bill was in the 104th, I believe it was, division. And they had fought heavily. They had been heavily involved in Europe. But Bill and I had been close for several years. And it was just a fantastic meeting. So we set up a meeting the next night. There were two other men from Stillwater in Bill's 104th Division, a fellow by the name of Henry Hutton and one of the Vega boys. Unfortunately, the next morning at 7 o'clock, I was transferred out and down to Camp Callan. So that hometown meeting with those other three never transpired. Okay. Did you make use of the GI Bill when you returned home? Okay, Mike, I'd, I'd like to go back to the, the okay. other question you sure. asked me just for okay. a moment. When I was discharged in Camp Callan, I was given something like $159 cash and issued the ruptured duck to return home. And it may seem strange for anyone listening now, why would the Army pay a soldier in cash? Why not send them by troop train or something like that back home. On the weekend I was discharged, November the 14th, 1945, one of the, our fleets, my recollection is correct, the third fleet, was coming in from the Pacific. And because they had been involved and had been in service so long, all the railroad transportation, air transportation, bus transportation was commandeered by the service. So when I was discharged and I wore this ruptured duck, I was classified as a civilian. I believe I had the right then to wear the uniform for a month. So a chap by the name of Stan Daly, 
from Lock Haven, Pennsylvania, and myself decided we better hit the road. So we started hitchhiking home. And I believe after about 20 rides, we finally met a man in Arizona who was coming back to Indianapolis, Indiana. And we took turns driving, staying overnight in uh, some place in uh, Oklahoma, Stillwater, I believe. And we arrived back in Indianapolis maybe two days later, and from thence I took a train to Albany. Okay. How about the GI Bill? Did you make use of it? The GI Bill. <laughs> uh, the service afforded me a wonderful opportunity. One, to travel, see much of the United States. Uh, secondly, to meet people of all colors, all religions, educated and uneducated. And I discovered that, boy, what a country. We really have to get along with each other. We need each other so much. And I had great clerical skills, accounting skills. I knew nothing about military expertise. I might say I went overseas as an infantry replacement and perhaps I, I should mention my infantry skills. I can't close one eye to sight a rifle. I went out on a Sunday, I, I'm sorry, I went out during the week and I shot and scored something like 67 or 69, which is flunking. I believe the passing score is about 120. Well, I went out on a Sunday. They didn't wave the red flag or Maggie's drawers. I was, I was given a score of 192, which would make me an expert. I couldn't. I couldn't hit the target. What was I going to say? What was I going to do? <laughs> so I went over without that great skill. So I was very fortunate to survive and to be made a typist clerk instead of being sent up on the front line as a replacement. I met Red Sheen Dace, a Hall of Famer. That was a nice experience. I met a lot of fellows that were uh, lawyers in civilian life, teachers in civilian life. So later, as a result of the GI Bill and the uh, sacrifices of my dear wife, I was able to be, get an education. I obtained a bachelor's degree and about 24 hours toward my master's degree on the GI Bill. And I finished it uh, with my own contribution. I taught high school for four years. After the arrival of our first child, my wife had, to, uh, had some health problems. Uh, couldn't care for him and had to return to work herself. So she sponsored my law school education. So when I was 33, I went back to law school and obtained my law degree as a result of her many sacrifices. But the GI Bill and meeting those lawyers, teachers in the service uh, gave me an opportunity to acquire an education and. I feel very honored and privileged because of it. Okay. Did you join any veterans organizations? I have been a member of the Earl J. Manning American Legion Post Number 490 in Stillwater since about December of 1945. It's a wonderful post. Uh, we built a, a new building there back around 46, 47. Uh, I've served there in various positions over the years. Uh, it's just been a very, very pleasant experience. It's a social center. The Sons of the American Legion do a marvelous job there today. Uh, it's just a wonderful post. Mm -hmm. Did you stay in contact with anyone that you uh, served with? For a time, yes. I might share another with you. When I was in Fort Ontario, which is located in Oswego, New York, and later when I was in Pine Camp, which is now called Fort Drum, 
located just outside of Watertown, New York. I had a chap living, <coughs> residing next to me, the next bunk, the next bed. And his name was Will Willard Sauter, S-A-U-T-E-R. Willard was a conscientious objector. And on his service record, there was a stamp about three inches high, conscientious objector. Willard had great skills. He was an artist. He could see something and paint it, and the, his painting would be the equivalent of a picture, of a photograph. Remarkable. Uh, we corresponded for a time. The last I knew, he was in Arizona. Just a remarkable person. He did such great work that the uh, chief, I don't know his title of our outfit, called him in one day and said, uh, Willard, we're so proud and we're so happy with the fantastic work you've done with us that I'm willing to take that off and whatever. And Willard said, no, those are my feelings. And I understand later he went overseas as a medic. But he was a, just a fine, conscientious individual, but a conscientious objector for, I believe, valid personal reasons for himself. Okay, do you have anything else that you wanted to add? Or? Yes, I've, uh, I have been uh, privileged and honored to serve as either a master of ceremonies or to be guest speaker at many annual Memorial Day events in my hometown of Stillwater. I think I have probably addressed the assemblies there 11 or 12 times over the years. And I think that's a very small contribution when I think of the sacrifices that others have made, the lives that were lost, and the various wars we fought. And if I can say something and remind people of their tremendous sacrifices and service, I consider it a privilege. And I've had that privilege many times, and I'm very grateful for it. Well, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate the opportunity to share these stories with you. All right. Okay. I forgot about that. I forgot the agents. Okay. All right. Tell us. You want to tell us about that? Sure. I got it. This picture is a picture that uh, was taken, I believe, in either Black River or Watertown, New York, probably in February or March of 1944. A friend of mine and myself noticed uh, an advertisement in one of the camp's papers up there. I don't know what the special was, but uh, we could get a certain number of photographs and we wanted to get some and send it home. So we went to this studio, and the photograph was taken by a very young, attractive photographer, and uh, it's easy to understand the smile. <laughs> and I, I value it highly to this day. All right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>